unlike anything we've ever faced. Aggressively infectious. 10 to 20 times more infectious than the flu. Can leave you asymptomatic for up to two weeks, which means you could be unintentionally infecting everyone around you and never realize it. It's especially deadly to the elderly and immunocompromised. Their flames suffocated by an invisible monster that's now cloaked most of the planet. There's really no way to put into words the kind of existential fear that many of us are now beginning to feel as we see the numbers of confirmed cases and those who have already succumbed to COVID skyrocket. And we're still only in the beginning stages of this pandemic. The global economy is beginning to shudder. Social networks are straining and heaving. The true nature of capitalism and the heartless corporatism within America has now been laid Bear, and the empire is at last crumbling. And we've known for decades that the wealthy elite who have crammed themselves into every corner of government, just like they've crammed every corner of their wallets full with the wealth that they stole from us, they would happily sit back and watch as the poor or undesirables in their eye slowly die off one by one. But the kind of abject cruelty that is now on display by the GOP and from Trump himself is just, it's truly evil. And there really aren't any words that could capture the utter depravity and soullessness of the men and women who in the face of a global pandemic do nothing to help those who are the most vulnerable to infection, death, joblessness, houselessness, they instead wave away our dire needs, propagate and lie about the seriousness of this disease, take advantage of a crisis in order to discriminate against marginalized communities like my own, point the finger at the Chinese, and blame anyone but themselves for the horror that is soon to come in this country. What happens the moment our healthcare system is overloaded? They've made it clear that the economy and their precious stocks are more precious to them than actual human lives. It's a concept that's known as shock therapy, which author and activist Naomi Klein, in her book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, describes as the exploitation of national crises, which are disasters or upheavals, to establish controversial and questionable policies while citizens are excessively distracted to resist effectively. And we're now seeing this intentional exploitation and heartlessness play out across every single level of American society. The xenophobic sentiments that fueled the Chinese Exclusion Act are once again coming to light with senators like John Cornyn having the gall to say things like, these viruses are transmitted from the animal to the people, and that's why China has been the source of a lot of these viruses like SARS, like MERS, the swine flu, and now the coronavirus. So I think they have a fundamental problem, which will directly lead to increased marginalization or even violence against those of Asian descent. Never mind that Cornyn and many others are intentionally misrepresenting Chinese culture and painting it as dirty in order to reinforce global hierarchies, and that even if no one ate meat, there's still a chance that these diseases would spread through farming and agriculture. Trump himself continues to call COVID the Chinese virus and was even spotted crossing corona out in his notes and writing Chinese in its place. Again, when Republicans see an opportunity to discriminate and strip more and more of our rights away from us, you can bet they will not pass that up. Arizona Republican Congressman Andy Biggs voted against the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act because it gave protection to same-sex couples and tried to make the claim that said protections had nothing to do with COVID and that that's just par for the course for the left. <laughs> killing the gays to own the libs. That's just par for the course for the party of uh, family values. But it gets much worse from here. Jonathan Fulkerson, an attorney general from Ohio, sent a letter to abortion clinics in Dayton, Cleveland, and Cincinnati 
ordering them to halt non-essential and elective surgical abortions or face steep consequences. And days later, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton did the same. The GOP also delayed a COVID relief bill authored by Nancy Pelosi because provisions were made to protect funding for abortions, much to the chagrin of conservatives. Now, of course, you do have to save room for the oncoming surge of infections. You have to save hospital beds but you also have to ensure that you don't lay the foundation for stripping rights away from people and use the coronavirus pandemic as a cover for it. In a statement, Planned Parenthood said, using this very real public health emergency to attack abortion coverage shows a despicable lack of concern about the severity of the crisis. And writer Jill Filipovich said, it's very on brand for pro-lifers to refuse to save a whole bunch of lives, which does extend to their entire ideology. Also ironic is that the relief bill that was authored by the GOP actually screws over poor Americans who are the most vulnerable to COVID. Those who make less than $25 a month or less receive nothing, while those who receive more only get one $600 check. One. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and others are actively fighting for a universal basic income, rent freezes, nationwide moratorium on evictions, utility shutoffs, while the GOP can't even be bothered to give people more than the scraps off of the bottom of their shoes. There are people who have already been laid off, that have no income, and potentially won't for months, but landlords and bankers still refuse to budge. If you have no income, you can't pay rent. That this is even a question shows you how desperate of a situation we're currently in. And of course, wouldn't you know it, the one and only Ben Shapiro couldn't resist making himself heard throughout this whole situation by comparing the Democratic relief bill to slavery, calling it the greatest seizure of private property in the history of the United States. I mean, other than slavery. And I don't even have the energy to think about trying to pick that one apart, so we're just gonna leave it. While the fight continues over a relief bill, however, steps are being taken by the GOP to essentially monitor all of your online messages and activity. Lindsey Graham and Richard Blumenthal co-authored the Earn It Act, which would outlaw encryption and allow the government to see everything that you're doing. So. Imagine the Patriot Act on steroids. Whenever we were all protesting the repeal of net neutrality and the consequences that would follow, this is what we were talking about. This means that content creators like myself, Vosh, Xander Hall, could potentially be censored. Legislation is already being considered that would allow people to be jailed for any reason and for an indefinite period of time, and it feels like we are truly on the precipice of the U.S. becoming an actual authoritarian state. And we're already seeing eerie parallels to North Korea, which with how the GOP glorifies punishment and subjugation and crafts a very specific media narrative that glorifies the president or leader and demonizes all of his enemies. The truth is never once spoken from their lips. And even during a global pandemic, they still can't be bothered to tell the American people the true nature of COVID. They'd rather continue to enrich themselves, protect their inner circle, and circumvent whatever laws necessary to keep us down and keep themselves in power, instead of using every resource at their fingertips to ward off or at the very least slow down the most dangerous outbreak we've seen in at least a century. But it isn't just the GOP that's endangering people's lives. The Democratic primary should be rendered null and void because the DNC chose to hold primaries during a pandemic, instead of either ordering people to stay home, holding the primaries off, or setting up some sort of online voting system. Voting stations were closed with no announcement whatsoever. Some stations had no workers working at all. And I was honestly stunned that neither Bernie or Biden stood up and said that they should hold off until the pandemic was either over or at least less severe. And speaking of not saying anything, Trump himself delayed any sort of testing for two months 
all to prop up his own approval rating. He intentionally ignored every single warning and every bit of information given to him and instead continues to spread dangerous misinformation like it'll die off when it gets warm out that has directly contributed to millions of Americans still thinking it's okay to go out and gather in large numbers, causing the disease to spread even further. He rejected tests that were proven by the World Health Organization to work and chose to rely on the CDC even though he let the entire pandemic response team, which, mind you, Obama set up, go without cause, he slashed the CDC's budget and stepped back while the CDC issued a guideline that would allow those infected with COVID to return to work quickly if they wore a mask, even though they'd still be both immunocompromised and highly contagious. The CDC's coronavirus page has also gone nearly a week without any updates and Americans desperately need the most current information in order to keep themselves safe. UN human rights experts responded to this by saying, it is essential that governments provide truthful information about the nature of the threat posed by coronavirus and governments everywhere are obligated under human rights law to provide reliable information in accessible formats for all. During a press conference, Trump even went as far as outright refusing to take any responsibility for the destruction that he has already caused. He knew what was coming. His entire cabinet and all of Congress knew what was coming. The wealthy donors and stockbrokers, the bankers and billionaires, the CEOs and corporate leaders, politicians and pharmaceutical bigwigs. They all knew. And what did they do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Richard Burr, the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, warned a small group of connected constituents weeks ago to prepare for dire economic and societal effects of the coronavirus, according to an article by Tim Mack of NPR. On the same day that Trump held a press conference and said, it's going to disappear, one day it's like a miracle, it'll disappear, Barr delivered a very different message. There's one thing I can tell you about this. It is much more aggressive in its transmission than anything we have seen in recent history, and it is probably more akin to the 1918 pandemic. Not only that, it was revealed that he had sold off $1.6 million in stocks in one day, one week before the market crashed, and his committee was also receiving daily updates on the growth of the current pandemic. While Burr and others in the Senate and Congress enrich themselves, collusion is already happening behind the scenes to artificially inflate the price of a potential COVID vaccine, leaving millions of Americans at the mercy of our broken healthcare system. Danny Eskinney, a Boston resident, received a $34,927 bill after being treated for COVID and she had insurance. But even that isn't enough for the ghouls within Big Pharma who are just chomping at the bit for all the extra profit that this could bring them. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said during a congressional hearing while discussing the price of the vaccine that we would want to ensure that we work to make it affordable, but we can't control that price because we need the private sector to invest. Basically scoffing at the idea of taking the private sector's hold off of this so the people can all be helped. And millions are already out of work and projections are being made that up to 30% of the country could be unemployed by the end of the summer. The height of unemployment during the Great Depression was 25%. We have all the resources necessary to at least stabilize the economy for the duration of the pandemic, but lo and behold, the Federal Reserve threw $1.5 trillion at the stock market as it crashed, which bumped it up for an hour, and then it crashed again. One and a half trillion dollars.
gone. When the economy is already as strained as it is, the government and wealthy investors had their eyes on the economy instead of the people. They have willingly prolonged and worsened the oncoming outbreak and economic collapse to an unforeseen but likely horrific degree. All the while, millions upon millions of workers who haven't been laid off yet will be forced to work in environments in which they will be exposed to hundreds upon hundreds of potentially exposed people every single day. Even though the vast majority of them have no benefits, sick pay, health insurance, or protection, even if they become infected with COVID, meaning they're forced to either expose themselves to people already sick with the virus in order to keep getting a paycheck, or risk losing their jobs if they choose to stay home in order to prevent spreading the virus to their coworkers. Either way, you lose. Jeff Bezos, who paid nothing in taxes last year, and other CEOs of companies like McDonald's get to sit back, shielded from the devastation that's only begun to bury us, and reap all of the benefits while workers are literally being thrown to the wolves. They've built massive fortress walls around themselves, like the wall an attack on Titan, and we must therefore be like the Titans who burst through and, uh, eat the rich. Almost every social safety net for the working class has been dissolved to the point where we essentially have nothing. While those at the top accumulate more wealth in one year than the 99% of us would accumulate in 10 lifetimes, allowing them to ride out the storm of COVID relatively unscathed, while the rest of us could potentially be wiped out if we were to be infected. It's a concept known as social murder, which was introduced by Frederick Ingalls in his 1845 book, The Condition of the Working Class in England, and described as a situation in which the class at which present holds social and political control, or the bourgeois, places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and unnatural death. That the poor and working class, what little of it currently remains, have essentially been turned into martyrs for the cause against our will should have us all angry as hell. You should be looking at this situation with a blazing hellfire in your eyes. With every headline I read, I find my jaw dropping over and over again, and all I can think is that A, these politicians are absolutely mad, and B, the time for revolution is at last upon us. I'm an anarcho-communist, so I already have immense disdain for the intentionally abusive system that we currently live in. Capitalism was built to punish the less fortunate over and over again for no other reason than that they were born into poverty and thus are likely to never escape it, trapped in a never-ending cycle. And the more theory I read and the more aware I become, the more I realize that now more than ever is when we all need to rise up in unison and say enough. The only reason these systematic hierarchies exist is because those in power understand fully what would happen if millions of angry Americans all rose up at once to overthrow the system that could give two shits about them and would leave them out to die if it could. But people are dying already. COVID is going to kill staggering numbers of people if some sort of mass action isn't taken. If the CDC is right in its prediction that up to 90% of Americans could be infected with it by the time this is all over, and if the fatality rate continues to hover at around 3%, out of the 300 million Americans alive right now, 8 million of them could die. This is what we're facing. This is why we need to be taking COVID seriously. And it is not an over-exaggeration to say that we are literally fighting for our lives. But saying all of this is one thing. How do we put that anger into action? And what exactly must we do in the coming weeks and months to ensure that we all have the best chance at both protecting and fighting for one another and laying the foundation for a true workers' nation? It all comes down to organizing, networking, effective communication on why it's important for us to fight back, and gathering enough people to form a formidable opposition to the wealthy elites who have claimed the Iron Throne for themselves. They refuse to give workers in retail, food and grocery, sick pay, 
They refuse to properly protect them from exposure to COVID. They refuse to provide health care or any sort of benefits that would contribute to their well-being. They refuse to pay a living wage even as our financial livelihoods crumble. And American Johnson of Non-Compete was dead on when he said in one of two articles that he wrote for Medium that this disease is much more likely to kill the elderly, the poor and uninsured, the immunocompromised, Systemic neglect has always constituted genocide. In the context of a pandemic, the cruelty of denying the human right of health care is even more apparent. And I'm going to link those articles below, which have all sorts of great resources and go into much greater detail about how to mobilize against the capitalist class. So definitely check them out. I'm also going to link a video he put together on why now is the time to call for a nationwide general strike, which I will also link above. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa, wait, a strike? With how awful conditions already are for us? And that's a completely understandable reaction. The last thing we should be doing is gathering in large numbers. So mass public protests definitely are not an option right now. Because of the intense union busting that's been done by powerful corporate and government figures over the past century, Unions have become fairly decentralized, unorganized, and don't have the collective power necessary to plant their feet firmly in place and withstand everything that is currently being thrown at them. But this is the best opportunity we've had in so long to join together in a modern mass mobilization of voices, mutual aid networks, community organizations, groups organizing rent, debt, and utility strikes, and workers looking to unionize and or strike in mass. The IWW, or the Industrial Workers of the World, is the best resource for understanding the rights that you should have as a worker and how we can lay the foundation for a true workers' nation. So how do we get there from here? The IWW lays out the AEIOU of organizing, which is A. Agitate and get people mad. E. Educate, teach about our options and ability to fight back. I. Inoculate, or give a taste of the BS that management regularly throws and counter it. O. Organize and get people together in a committee to pursue further action and you unionize. I have personally never seen class consciousness awaken so quickly among those who typically aren't politically involved or inclined, as well as the realization that we must do away with the idea that class collaborationism, or the belief that division of society into a hierarchy of social classes, is positive and beneficial to society. All it'll take is the right spark to cause an explosion of anger that will be aimed directly at our oppressors in the capitalist class. But the idea of actually confronting the power is scary. I'll admit that. In an article for Organizing Work, M.K. Lees says, Fear is everywhere in organizing. Fear of confrontation, fear of instability, fear of the unknown, fear of the effects on our lives from retaliation by people in power, like the path to the dark side. Fear can lead to apathy, which leads to isolation, which leads to self-doubt, and then feeling like a failure. But just by rallying together, we've already succeeded. That's huge, and it takes enormous bravery in our modern society. You just have to figure out where to take that energy from where you are. And it will take a while. In order for a mass movement like this to be effective, it must be organized. It must be built from the ground up and everyone must be in it for the long haul. These are scary times that we're living in, but the one thing that will keep us going is the support and love that we are able to give one another. We are stronger together, and together we will rebuild society into something beautiful. We will make it through this. Hold on to one another. Don't be discouraged. Keep your focus and eyes ahead, and keep that fire inside of you burning hot, and bright. Like I said in part one of this series, we outnumber the corporate elite by a million to one. If we refuse to bend to their will and bring the companies to their knees by refusing to come back to work, they will be forced to either treat us fairly or be shut down. So we already have what we need. 
And now it's time to put the power of community and solidarity into action. Of course, the question does remain, what will society look like once this is all over? Not to do this to you again, but uh, you'll have to wait till next week. Ah! All right, and that is going to do it for this week's video. If y'all enjoy, be sure to drop a like down below. If you haven't already, hit subscribe, ring the bell, so you will be notified for all of my future content. And until then, everyone, be strong. Give as much love as you possibly can. Take care of yourself while you're in isolation. Do whatever it takes to keep your mental self strong, healthy, clear, as well as your physical self, your emotional self. Take care of yourself. Give love to everyone around you. Remind everyone you know that we are not alone in this and that we're going to make it through. I love y'all. I will see you next week.